Good morning. It's a real pleasure that you've managed to make time for me, Kinewe Molopiani. I understand that your your family name, your 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 Molopiani, actually means little fire. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So if you if you break up my family name, um, Molo means fire, and Piani is actually little. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little firecracker. <laughs> I, I can see that. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Can we maybe start with what seems to me to be a big similarity between the travel and tourism industry and what you do? And I know you're part of the industry and, and it's important to you and we'll talk about that shortly. But one of the things that travel and tourism absolutely relies on is geographical travel. And of course, one of the things that you offer through the interpretation of archaeological sites is the opportunity for time travel. Yeah. And at the heart of both kinds of travel, there seems to me to be a real need to create meaningful connections. Does that fit with your understanding of how the visitors who come to the site that you manage, is that how they, they need to get a meaningful connection, don't they? Yes, they do. I mean, that's that's something that we try to do at the Murray Ping and Stackfontaine Visitor Centre. Um, because we are the, the hub of the cradle of humankind uh, in South Africa. So we're like the catch-all educational centre for the um, evolutionary discoveries that have been made um, in that region of the country, of the world even, because we're a World Heritage Site. Um, so we try to make every visitor's experience really worthwhile and really mean something. Um, because otherwise, there's really no point of traveling. Like, I, I, I've been traveling for like, since my younger years. Um, and every trip that I've taken is meaningful because of the memories that we've made, but also because of the stuff that I've learned. Um, on those trips. They, my parents have always made sure that those trips are meaningful and educational as well. And that's sort of something that I and my guys like to bring forward in the tours that we offer. We really try and make it memorable and educational for our visitors. Because in some ways for you, it, it's a bigger challenge, I think, than it is for for if you like ordinary tourism you know if, mm. if you go to, to a restaurant or you go and visit um if you go into the townships and you have those social interactions with 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 different local people that creates lots of meaningful memories for people yeah. but in a sense you're handicapped by the fact that you've just got bits of metal and other things which have come out of the earth haven't you it, yeah it yeah. can be quite a struggle to make the archaeology meaningful for people yeah, it, it does become a bit of a challenge because archaeology and paleoanthropology have been viewed as very boring, um, simply because that, that world has been dominated by old white men that just go on and on and on with their stories and you just like, bruv, get to the point. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, I think, a way in which we have made it meaningful is that it is the local people that are telling the story of their site. And you also were pushing academics of color and not just academics of color, but academics in more of a social role, because I think as academics, we're sort of in our ivory towers a lot and we're hidden from the rest of the world. Whereas with my generation, the millennials, is we're so into social media and being out there in people's faces and sharing what our passions are and kind of like making that cool in a way. I assume that you have the same problems with paleoanthropology in South Africa that most paleoanthropologists have, which is a constant shortage of funding. It, it, it almost never becomes something where it's easy to find the money to do the digging and the research. And I assume that's your experience too. Um, both yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that there are very limited funding resources that we can tap into because, I mean, South Africa has got bigger problems than 
the tourism industry and paleoanthropology. Like there, there are a lot of economic injustices that have happened over the past couple of years, you know, before I was even born, um, a world in which my parents grew up in and were born into. So we're still trying to overcome those economic injustices. Um, but also know in the sense that there are now a lot of funding bodies that will fund your venture. You just need to approach them and sort of like have the right face for it. Um, as blunt as I could put it, but that's the reality. If you have the face that they can fund, you know, you're, you're the right color, you're the right sex, you're selling the right product that is going to bring people in, then people will invest in it. And then at that point, it's now your responsibility to make sure that this venture actually works out and is long term um, as well. So in, in, in right in the heart of what you were saying there is this notion of bringing people in, engaging people, making that meaningful connection. And I assume that you have, you will have, I'm sure, the same problems that conservation has. If you're not able to make a connection with the broad electorate of South Africa, in the end, you're going to be reliant on external funding. Because yeah. in order to get attention nationally, there have to be a lot of people in South Africa who recognize the importance of the cradle of mankind. Yeah, yeah. And also you, you need to have the right kind of people working in the cradle that are able to get people interested, right? It, it's a skill that you're not actually taught at uni as to how to get people engaged. We are so interested in the research and our topic of interest. And it's like, okay, that's nice. A bash skull is very interesting to me, but how is that interesting to the next person? So it goes hand in hand with storytelling as well. Of course, um, that's what the, sorry, but, but that's exactly what the, the advertisers, the, the, the marketing experts talk about when they talk about the danger of self-referencing, of thinking yeah. that it's meaningful for other people because it's meaningful for you. Yeah. Now, yeah. presumably the challenge in changing that is to find ways of telling the stories and i don't mean by that fictional stories but 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 coherent narratives about the meaning of the objects that you're digging up and discovering mm. you've got to find ways of making those meaningful for the population of south africa and that's a, di a very diverse population both in ethnicity and in age isn't it yeah yeah it's very different um, and what, from what I've seen is that by simply changing the main voice of the narrative, you attract a whole lot, a bigger audience, you know, instead of having an old professor talking about the fossils, you have a younger researcher talking about it and all of a sudden it's hip hop and happening. Um, so that, that was, that has been very well, interesting. Absolutely, that's fascinating. Why do you think that is? What's the dimensions of that? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure why it is that is. I think we just relate to people closer to our age, um, closer to what we ourselves look like. Um, I think that that really is the key thing, is that you, you've got to be very close to your target audience. Um, it's no use me talking to people in Europe when I'm in Africa, when I should actually be connecting to local Africans about our own national heritage so that we can in turn go out and share it with the rest of Europe and the US, right? Rather than me going directly to Europe and the US and selling Africa. I think we need to start at home, get that sorted and then move abroad. It's interesting because part of it, I'm sure all that's true. I'm not, I'm, you know, let's take that as, as read. But it seems to me the other dimension of it is there's, a, there's an issue about proximity. The, the fact that younger people, younger black people in South Africa are going to relate more to you than they would to me, quite mm. understandably. That's in the nature of human relationship. But it's mm. also in the language that's used, isn't it? I mean, you don't yeah. sound like a boring professor of archaeology. I think you'd really struggle to manage that. 
Now, you might manage it in another 50 years. Who knows? But you're certainly not <laughs> able to do it now. Yeah, no, thank goodness. <laughs> I know, of course. Um, but that and the red hair helps with that, obviously. It's a real <laughs> kind of fi the little fire dimension. So one of your challenges then, I guess, is to increase the amount of domestic tourism that you are able to track to the cradle of mankind. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that is a real struggle. I mean, before pre-COVID, in a world before COVID, this was not a major issue because of the prestige of the cradle of humankind. I mean, we've had fascinating fossils being discovered in this region, like Mrs. Place, Littlefoot, um, Sidiba, Oshapitka Sidiba, and Hermana Lady, which have all been showcased. Um, at the Cradle of Humankind, you know, at the Marapain Visitor Center. But after COVID, you know, when we, we've had to shut our doors for the safety of ourselves and everyone else, it's become very difficult. Very difficult. Um, so now, you know, with, with South Africa going into level one, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to go back into like the higher level with us approaching winter. Um, domestic travel has been limited and as much as we would like to attract more people to our sites, it's difficult because we have to maintain social distancing and all the health regulations. So um, it's, I think it's, it's going to be a while before the tourism industry really finds its balance between the pandemic and travel. But in the meantime, we sort of need to make sure that the industry stays alive, the cradle stays alive, and that by the time the floodgates are open, we're able to receive um, all those visitors coming through. I suppose the opportunity is, is for some kind of, you know, there's a lot of talk in the industry about building back better. And perhaps it is an opportunity for you to, to, to relaunch with a new, a slightly different identity perhaps i mean one of the things i haven't looked at your website for a while but i did look at it about six months ago and i was surprised how dominant the the images of the building are rather than the objects when you first go to the site and sometimes it's the objects i mean i've just become very interested in sutton who in the uk which um was discovered in what 39 i think and excavated just as the war yeah um but what's got me into that, interestingly, is the film. And it's because of, of reliving the excitement of the discoveries. And yet that's something archaeologists hardly ever talk about. It's private stuff to them, but they forget that actually the public's really interested in that, that excitement of discovering something in the ground. Uh, and yeah. they're, they're never personally, go, well, they're highly unlikely ever to have that experience but they're interested in what it means to other people, I think. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, the, the, I think there's gonna be a shift in that and that scientists are gonna be more open into yeah. um, revealing their, their um, discoveries and stuff. So I've been working with Professor Lee Berger for I think about two years now. Um, and we just opened up a relatively new site called UW105. And we went straight to social media and we we're posting every day on all these discoveries that happen because this is the stuff that people are interested in, right? It's how I got interested in archeology. span um, Although I wasn't watching a real life person um, dig up an artifact or something, I actually started off with cartoons, The Adventure of Tintin. Oh, and, right. the first, <laughs> and the first episode I ever watched, it was it was a Saturday morning with my mom. The first episode we ever saw was Cigars of the Pharaoh. And, you know, Tintin's not an archaeologist, he's a journalist, but he goes through all these historical mysteries. I remember like that. Yeah. It's like my favorite show ever. Um, and I actually have a, a picture frame poster <laughs> of that episode just to remind me of where it is that I started from. And just from watching that cartoon series, and then came Indiana Jones, and then came Lara Croft, that I was like, you know what, this is something that I really want to do. Um, and then, you know, I went to Varsity, and then I got sucked into the, the ivory tower and keeping everything a secret. Everything's hush-hush until we're sure that 
this is, is what it is we think it is and then you um, release it not necessarily to like the general public but to the academic world and just like well, what's the point of what it is that we're doing if we can't share it with everyone um, so I mean Professor Berger started this whole open access into discovery, exploration, and finds back in 2010, I think it is, when Sadiba was announced. He really just like opened the doors as to what it is that he was doing. And in 2015, I think it was Rising Star came about. And again, that was like a huge open access Nat Geo documentary kind of vibe. Mm. And from then on, we've sort of, we've taken on to things like Twitter. And just streaming live videos in YouTube, and that's really been a huge hit. I, I get so many um, emails and, and requests and stuff for like what's happening, what's been happening with UW105, and that's quite exciting. And it would be really nice to see that change in the ivory tower sort of collapsing in a way and becoming more easily accessible to everyone else which will in then turn um, be of benefit to the tourism industry because then these places will be known and we can filter in locals into these areas to keep them preserved and, you know, the whole conservation thing. I, as I was saying to you earlier, before we started recording the interview, I had a brief period in my life when I was taking groups of adult, um, their adult education students in the main to archaeological sites in Greece and the thing I learned from that is I knew nothing about archaeology really but I knew I was kind of vaguely interested um, but what was fascinating was was listening to the group debating what various things meant and they mm. became very engaged through that process of being allowed themselves to think about what the what they were looking at and what it meant now obviously on greek sites that's quite different because they're they're big in the main they're big chunks of rock so they're, mm. they're kind of more monumental in that sense and a lot of what you're discovering is being dug up and it's been buried and they're smaller pieces but yeah. i think that uh, that opportunity to enable people to engage in the debate even if they get it wrong the engagement brings them in it makes it meaningful they remember they have that that argument that discussion and archaeology needs that, I think, doesn't it? If it's going to attract a, a wider public, it needs to be more accessible. Yeah, it, it, I mean, just for archaeology to survive, yeah. it needs people to start talking about it and to take an interest in it. Yeah. And also for the inner circles of the industry to actually have an interest in the people that are coming in. Uh, I mean, I've, I've come across so many people um, either at, at work at the visitor center or even personally online that they're like, oh, you're doing so much great work in archeology. span You've done so well for yourself. This was something I really wanted to go into as a kid. And I'm just like, but then why didn't you? Yeah. Like, well, we both know why they didn't. It's actually quite difficult to do what you've done. Isn't you it? You think so? Yeah, I do actually. Well, how many, how many, how many opportunities are there for anybody to get into a master's course in archaeology and particularly somebody from as far away from York as you happen to live? I mean, you don't, don't underrate what you've achieved is, is well, all I think. No, no, I meant it a compliment. Come, look, we, we're coming towards the end of this and there will be, we're going to show this globally, I'm sure. So there are going to be people who know nothing about the cradle of humankind and there'll be lots of people like me who, to their shame, have not visited. But I wonder whether you couldn't just, if we don't just end this with you doing the elevator pitch for why the cradle of humankind really matters. I think right, I owe okay. you that. I owe you that. <laughs> Here we go. Putting my best foot forward. Okay, so the cradle of humankind is a unique space in the entire world, right? Where about 40% of the early human ancestors have been excavated. 40%, I mean, that, that seems very little, but it's quite a lot. Um, with the first being discovered in 1924 uh, by Dr. Robert Broom, Professor Robert Broom, I think it was, um, of the Tongue Child. And uh, in 1947, we have 
Australopithecus um, africanus, which is Mrs. Place. And these two fossils basically broke the internet before the internet was a thing because they showcase that humanity actually started in Africa and not just Africa, but the southern tip of Africa. And that is where the cradle of humankind is. So the, the visitor center at Marapeng essentially is, as I've said before, a hub in which all the stories around the fossils that have been discovered, that are currently still being discovered um, about the human race are being put together in one space and made easily accessible for anybody to understand. There's no point in hiding this information from everybody. Everyone should have access to it. And that is what we aim for is, is to making it easily accessible and exciting for people to watch. Yeah. And just to emphasize what you said, these are non-fiction stories. Yes. Non-fiction stories, they're all real non -fiction. life. Non-fiction, they're for real, they're academically based, and they're the best understanding we can have of our very earliest ancestors and they're to be found in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. What, what will shock you, but I think it's true, I've not done the research to prove this, but if there, I think if I went out into the streets in Faversham and asked people where humanity originated, most people wouldn't have a clue. A few people would know it was Africa, but they would assume it was Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way, I think that's, I mean, I'm pleased for Kenya that, that people do understand that, but it's equally true that people have not understood the same thing about South Africa. And I think in that sense, everything that we can do through the Responsible Tourism Movement to help with the realisation of the importance of, of the Southern African landmass to the origins of our species is extremely important. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just a case of us being very loud about South Africa. Uh, I remember studying in York and, you know, telling people that I was from South Africa and people were like, oh, are you from Africa? And I'm just like, no, bro, Africa's a continent, <laughs> I'm from South Africa. And they just, they couldn't make that, that connection. And I was just like, oh God. Okay. It, when I was teaching um, master's students, I used to frustrate me that they were all talking about going to meet the ethnic diversity of Indochina or the Far East and I say you know there's far more ethnic diversity in Africa why, why aren't you going to Africa which has always been my passion yeah. Kinewe thank you very much um, for your time I really appreciate that it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and um, I'm sure I should want to talk to you again Yes, you will. And uh, hopefully next time it will be in a cave that I'm exploring for new fossils. And I will try not to fall as I do so many times. Thanks for your time. I look forward to meeting you. Thank Again, you. In <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs>